과연 지금 이런 기술주들의 상황 매그니피센트 세븐 그리고 과연 이런 엔비디아의 질주 AI 붐 이런 것들에 대해서 어떻게 봐야 되는지 그리고 여기서 그걸 사서 돈을 더벌수 있는지 아니면 뭘 다른 거를 뭘 사야 되나 결국은 기술주의 세상 아닙니까? 이런 기술주의 세상에 대해서 굉장히 가이던스를 줄수 있는 그런 분을 모셨습니다. 성조 어, 골드만삭스 자산운용의 어, 기술투자 공동 헤드 오늘 스피치 제목은 기술주 최고의 수익을 위해서 매그니피센트 세븐을 넘어서기 라는 제목입니다. 모시겠습니다. The blue bar, the blue line is NVIDIA's revenues as a percentage of that capex. So just two years ago, NVIDIA was 9% of the total capex spend. So if the cloud companies were spending $159 billion, NVIDIA's revenues into that was maybe about $14, $15 billion. Now, they're 50% of the total capex that these guys are spending are going into NVIDIA GPUs. Next year, if you look at consensus estimates for NVIDIA's revenues, you have another increase, which if you layer it against the capex, more than $1, more than $1 out of every $2 that's spent in capex has to be spent on an NVIDIA GPU. And we just think that ultimately that's unsustainable for two basic reasons. One is, we talked about right now all the AI activity is around AI training. We're trying to train the model to be much more effective. NVIDIA has 100% market share in training workloads. But ultimately, the most effective part of AI is when you start to infer in, and the market moves towards inference. And in inference, you don't need the highest powered, highest compute chip. You just need a chip that actually does that task extremely efficiently and extremely well. And so as the market moves to inference, we think that the competitive list changes in terms of which semiconductors are benefiting from that. Uh, and then secondly, if you think about Google, Amazon, and Microsoft, they are the most sophisticated technology spenders in the world. And what they're doing is they're trying to build their own semiconductor chips now. You know, Amazon's talked about Inferentia, Tranium, Uh, Google has its own TPU. They're building their own chips. And so ultimately, over time, the com competition for, uh, for NVIDIA is only going to grow. So if not NVIDIA and the Magnificent Seven, where are the three places that we're looking for to identify kind of the best ideas in tech going forward? We talked about um, on the semiconductor side. Let's start with semiconductors. So if NVIDIA has 100% market share today, and we think over the next four or five years, NVIDIA is still going to be dominant, but they're going to have maybe 70 to 80% market share of the, of the AI silicon market. We think that other 20 to 30% is likely to go to some other players. When I talked about the cloud companies building their own semiconductors, one of the companies that we think is going to benefit the most is a company called Marvell that develops ASICs. So ASICs are application-specific integrated circuits. And so it's a little bit of a, a less smart and less flexible chip. But if you tell it to do one task, it does extremely, extremely efficiently and extremely well. And as cloud companies build their own chips, they're going to rely on ASICs. So Marvell, we think, is a winner. We think companies like Avago also have an opportunity to win. AMD, if you think about the only other GPU maker in the world, it's AMD. Now, right now, there's a lot of skepticism on AMD because uh, NVIDIA's rolled out another chip called Blackwell. Their power and performance is so much better. How can AMD comp uh, compete? Well, the, what people don't understand is that AMD is not trying to compete in training with NVIDIA. Training is already, that game is already over. <laughs> They're not going to be able to compete there. But what AMD has invested a lot of resources in is when the market transitions from training to inference, they're really trying to capture a lot of market share in inference. And so as the market, once again, transitions from training to inference, we think AMD is well positioned to be able to gain some share. And then we also can't leave without talking about the memory players. So we put Micron here, but obviously Samsung and Hynix, all the DRAM players we think stand to benefit from this wave. Because the one thing that's consistent about every single AI processor is that it requires significantly much more DRAM onboard memory to be able to work 
generation to generation. So if you look at Blackwell to Hopper in NVIDIA, all it does is it increases the HBM by a significant amount. So we think memory, because of HBM, is going to see a, a, a huge demand acceleration. But what people aren't really, really appreciating as much, because I think HBM story is somewhat well understood, is that edge devices, so edge devices, I mean like PCs, phones, could also start to get more memory, right? Because for the longest time, because we put everything in the cloud, you don't need a lot of processing memory locally. But what's happening, though, is if you want to actually run large language models, small large language models on board locally on a device, you need to have a lot more processing memory in there. So if edge devices like smartphones and PCs, who have been kind of seeing memory flatten out for the last 10 years, start to go up, and you have HBM start to drive volume as well, we can see kind of a little bit of a renaissance in the memory manufacturers. And I love this because also the valuation at starting point is always very cheap for the memory guys. And so as AI continues to take off and as they, I think the market starts to appreciate this more, we think there's an opportunity in there as well. So, you know, obviously NVIDIA is still interesting, but we think that more of the returns in the semiconductor market are going to come from some of these players. Data and security is a very important bucket as well. So by the, over the next 12 months, all the AI training machines will have probably trained almost 100% of all the world's publicly available data. So that's, that's a crazy statistic. Every, every data point that's out there will have been trained by an AI right, by the end, by over the next 12 months. But what is not being trained so far? What's not being trained is all the data that sits inside of companies because the companies are scared to release this to a large language model. And the reason why is because they don't want their intelligence being shared with everybody else, right? Data is their competitive advantage. And so as enterprises start to experiment with AI, and as, a as AI becomes a bigger use case, they're going to need to make sure that the data is secure. And so Zscaler, which is one of the leaders in cloud security, we think is going to be a big beneficiary. Accenture, you might be like, wow, that's a consulting company. Why are they going to benefit? But every enterprise that wants to be able to secure AI is going to rely on consulting companies like Accenture to be able to benefit. Datadog plays within a category called observability. There we think they're also going to be a key beneficiary as well as enterprises move AI workloads up to the cloud. The last bucket is where it's really, really exciting, right? Is the applications that are going to be built on this. If you go back to like 1999, this was in the internet, and I think AI is going to be probably the biggest renaissance that we see in technology since 1999, the tech evolution, right? When the internet got started, the same thing happened. All the infrastructure stocks did extremely well, right? Remember Cisco became a, like a trillion dollar company. There was a company called JDS Uniphase that was laying cables and things like that. That became a very, very high value company. So the infrastructure got built first, but it took 10 years to absorb that infrastructure. The really, really interesting part of the internet was when the internet companies started to get developed, right? And so when Google and Amazon, these were like the ones that really benefited from this new technology. So the applications around AI, if you think about the infrastructure around AI, we're probably later innings of that build. But if you think about the applications that are being built on AI, we're just getting started, right? And, and what we're focused on right now is a subset of software companies that we think are now embedding very interesting features into their AI stack to be able to monetize AI. So I think everybody knows in this room, uh, you know, Microsoft Copilot, uh, Copilot like is Excel and PowerPoint and uh, Word documents haven't had any new changes in technology for the past like 20 years. But like for the first time, we're going to be able to really generate some real intelligence and some real momentum around these things. And so that's an example. But we also think that these three co uh, companies, especially a company like Salesforce, which recently was down 20% on earnings, but we think it's an opportunistic time because the momentum around Salesforce AI cloud is still going very, very strong. And we think they're going to be able to benefit from that trend. So the last thing that I wanted to talk about, let's move outside of technology to try to think about what other companies can benefit. Because everybody is always focused on what do, we, what do we invest in in the technology sector. But what we think is increasingly also equally important is to look at industrial companies, uh, basic material companies, and utility companies. Because what's AI doing? 
Jensen has talked about creating AI factories, right? Building these huge data centers that are just gonna process AI 24 seven for, for a very long time, right? Uh, on top of it, by the way, the US as a result of everything that's been happening geopolitically is on this path toward reshoring everything. We're reshoring semiconductor technology with the CHIPS Act. You know, we have $50 billion we're investing to be able to bring factory capacity and semiconductor capacity back to the US. I think you know, uh, a lot of my, our Korean American audience would know, but like EV factories, you know, to build battery facilities and things like that, that's all coming on short of the US. And so the US was outsourcing their manufacturing capacity for the better part of two decades. And that during that period of time, industrial companies didn't really see their backlogs grow that much in terms of new factories that are being created in the US. But the US industrial companies are right now seeing a big renaissance, and I don't think the market is appreciating how much demand acceleration there's likely to be over the next couple of years. This gives you a little bit of indication in terms of what the backlog is doing. These are the projects that have been announced, the mega projects that have been announced in the United States. We're just basically building everything in the U.S. again, in a way that, and a scale that we haven't seen. And then on top of it, we have AI factories that we're going to build that's not even in this chart. <laughs> so. Um, you know, we have to think, you know, it's, we, we love companies like uh, cement companies like Martin Marietta. So this is, uh, all they do is pour concrete, you know, but like concrete's extremely heavy and you need to be able to local, be locally present in the geographies. And it's something simple, but if you're building a lot of factories, you need a lot of concrete. United Rentals, machinery companies, right? So uh, in U.S. industrials are having a bit of a renaissance. The last thing is the utility companies, right? So... In the, in the United States, the electrical grid hasn't grown any wattage in the last like 10 years. But now a lot of people are forecasting as a result of AI, we're gonna go from 0% electricity growth to th potentially 3% annual growth for the next five years. And that's gonna put a lot of stress on the grid. And we just, unlike other commodities, you just can't bring that capacity online very quickly. So we think there's gonna be opportunities for utility companies and a lot of alternative energy companies to also benefit from this trend.